Okay, welcome back once again to Grockett's OGTV. I suppose it's not really welcome back if you were just tuning into a previous recording of the broadcast, but if you're tuning in live, welcome back. My name's Jim Jacobson. This is me up in the corner. I should probably turn on the pen. That's me up in the corner. Like I said, you're on grockett.com, and this is the GMAT edition, where we're going through the 12th edition of the Guide to the Exam, question by question, page by page, until we get uh, from one end of the book to the other. And when we left off last time, we were kind of in the middle of the data sufficiency section. And so that's where we'll pick up this time. <clears throat> Let's see, we were on, uh, we, let, we finished with question number 44 last time on page 276. So this time we will pick up with question number 45, the last question on page 276. So that's 276, number 45. And as always, since I can't count on everyone having watched every broadcast where I explain this, I write down uh, the shorthand for what each of the answer choices stands for in a data sufficiency question. And, uh, you know, where state, uh, answer choice A <clears throat> is that statement 1 alone is sufficient, B is that statement 2 is sufficient, statement uh, or answer choice C that together they are sufficient but individually they are insufficient to answer the question, D is that either one is sufficient on its own and we didn't con consult them in conjunction. And E is that neither one is sufficient on its own, nor are they sufficient in conjunction. So, uh, you know, I personally, when I'm doing, <clears throat> you know, my scrap paper for um, when I'm doing data sufficiency questions, I write out this rather than, uh, you know, so when I'm crossing off answer choices, you know, I can do that as opposed to this. Just a habit I got into. Uh, it's not something necessary to your own success, just giving you ideas for things that you can try if you want to. Anyway, question number 45. Uh, if r is a constant and um, a sub n equals r times n for all positive integers n, for how many values of n is a sub n less than 100? So um, let's get that down on e paper, a sub n equals r times n. So where r is a constant. So basically whatever the subscript is of our variable a, we just multiply that times r and that's what the number equals. So statement one, we find out that a sub 50 equals 500, which means that um, a sub 50 equals some constant times 50 because the same number that's in the subscript is what's being multiplied times r. Um, and so that's 500 equals um, r times 50, which means that r equals 10. And we need all the values for which um, a sub n equals 10 times n, and that needs to be less than 100. So 10n needs to be less than 100, n needs to be less than 10. So for how many positive integers n is uh, a sub n less than 100 as defined by this? Well, 9. There are 9 positive integers less than 10. Those are 1 through 9. I don't feel the need to write out them all for you. Um, statement 1 then is sufficient for us to answer the question. And we can cross off some of our answer choices. We can get rid of answer choice B, C, and E because all of those rely on statement 1 being insufficient. Let's take a look at statement 2. Uh, A sub 100 plus A sub 105 equals 2050. Looks like this one's going to be a little bit harder, but it isn't necessarily. Um, what this means is that these two guys mean that what's over, going on over here is r times 100 plus r times 105 because that's how this thing works up here. We can simplify this part of the equation as r times 100 plus 105 or r times 205 <clears throat> and that number originally then for the sum of these two numbers was 2050. So we can see pretty clearly dividing both sides by 205 
we get r equals 10. And then for the exact same reasons that um, listed up here, statement 2 is also sufficient. So we can cross off the answer that says statement 1 alone is sufficient, and we can circle with confidence answer choice D. Either statement on its own is sufficient. On to the next page, page 277, number 46. Okay, one, two, together, either, neither. So if R is represented by the decimal 0 0.T5, what is the digit T? T equals, who knows? No man can say, at least until we get to the statements. Let's take a look then. There isn't really any figuring that we can do. Um, so for this one, we just have to get right to it. So the digit, so this is r equals that. Here we have r is less than one third. Since the question is asking about decimals, we should convert that into decimal form. So r is less than 0.3333 dot dot dot. So um, if t is, uh, let's just say 3, then the decimal, then r is um, 0.35, which is not less than uh, one third, so it's not that. If t equals 2, it's 0.25, which is less than one third. t equals 1, 0.15. And don't forget that t itself could equal 0, 0 0.05. So we have, uh, we have to cross off this one because that's not less than one third. We have three possible values for the uh, tenths digit of this decimal. And remember with value questions, what does t equal? We only need one value for sufficiency, or to put it another way, only one value is the only sufficient answer. Three values, insufficient with a capital I. So it's not answer choice A and it's not answer choice D. Let's take a look at the second statement. Second one, um, tells us that r is less than one tenth. So that means r is less than 0.1 or 0 0.10. We can do the same thing here. Um, if t equals, let's just start with something that looks close. Um, if t equals 1, um, then the decimal, then r equals 0.15, <clears throat> which is not less than 0.1, so it can't be this. Um, the only thing left lower is t equals 0, where then r equals 0 0.05. That does satisfy the conditions, and there are no digits for t lower than 0, because you know it has to be a positive integer. Therefore, we have a single value for t, and statement 2 on its own is sufficient, allowing us to get rid of c and e, and identify b as the correct answer. So, 277, number 47. If the two floors in a certain building are nine feet apart, how many steps are there in a set of stairs that extends from the first floor to the second floor of the building? So, we may even imagine, then, two floors of the building down here. And we have a set of stairs that has to go up nine feet. So, you know, step, 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 dot, 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 step, step. This is an ellipsis of steps because we don't actually know how many there are. So really we need to know how tall each step is. We need to know, um, make it a different color, we need to know these distances, the increments in which these steps get, get, go up nine feet to the second story. So, statement one, each step is three quarters of a foot high. So, uh, step equals three fourths feet. So, to figure out the number of steps, the number of increments, the number of three quarter foot increments, we would simply divide nine by three fourths. And remember, when you are dividing by fractions, that's the same thing as nine times the inverse 
which equals 9 over 1 times 4 over 3. And so that, you know, again, it would be enough to know that we could solve. So once you get to this point, you could just say, well, my shift's over. Um, statement 1 is sufficient, so we can cross off B, C, and E. But it turns out it equals 12. Um, <clears throat> 36 divided by 3 equals 12. So there are 12 steps. Good to know. Statement 1 is sufficient, though, just as soon as we realize that we can divide 9 by another number and figure out how many there are. Statement 2, each step is 1 foot wide. So this was pi step um, equals 1 foot wide. Now I'm assuming by width that they mean um, this distance here. It wouldn't make sense to have a staircase that's literally one foot like across, you know, because people themselves wouldn't be able to go up the stairs. Not that it matters, uh, because either of those two measures are completely irrelevant to how many steps it takes to go up nine feet. Um, we found nothing about this distance here. There could be a problem like that where you would need both dimensions in order to figure out how many steps are required, but um, that's not this problem. Uh, the width of the steps, how, how deep they are, I guess, is another way to think about it, is not relevant, only the height. So statement two is insufficient on its own. Um, we can cross off answer choice D and identify A as the correct answer. So 277, number 48. Okay, so in June 1989, <clears throat> what was the ratio of the number of sales transactions made by a salesperson X to the number of sales transactions made by salesperson Y? So what the question is ultimately asking for is the June transactions of X over the June transactions of Y. So let's hope we get that in the answer choices. Statement number one. In June 1989, salesperson X made 50% more sales transactions than salesperson Y did in May 1989. So they, there's a shift of, of months here. So we can't use this information as presented, but it does give us an equation. It tells us that uh, June transactions for X equal 1.5, that's 50% more, the transactions of uh, salesperson Y in May. We would need both June X and June Y to answer the original question, so just getting June X insufficient, get rid of A and D. Statement 2, in June 1989 salesperson Y made 25 percent more sales transactions than in May 1989. So uh, this is June Y equals 25% more than uh, in May. Oops, 1.25. Unfortunately, this uh, pen doesn't have an easy method of erasing. Unless I change one of the colors to white. Ooh, I should totally do that. Um, Anyway, June uh, salesperson Y's transactions in June were 25% more, or 1.25 times, the transactions for May for that same person. But that alone doesn't give us June um, anything about salesperson X, which is what we actually need to answer the question. So statement two on its own is also insufficient. Now we have to consult them in conjunction. And remember, what we're looking for here is um, June X over June Y. We have each of those defined in terms of salesperson X, or excuse me, salesperson Y's transactions in May. So let's see how that works out. So June X is 1.5 times uh, what Y did in May over 1.25 what Y did in May. Of course, uh, as a fraction, you know, just assume this whole thing is a variable. We can cross this off. We get 
1.5 over 1. Point, over 1.25, um, which ends up you know being six fifths, and so then that could be presented as as a uh, as a percent. Although actually we are just asked for the ratio, not the percent, and really we just had to know that we could solve there. Once you got to this point, you could probably say, oh, there's clearly a solution for that. Um, I don't need to go any further. The two statements together are sufficient. We cross off neither one and identify the two of them together as sufficient. Forty nine on page two seventy seven. So if a is less than x and that's less than b and c is less than y and y in turn is less than d, is x less than y? So we have a, that's an a really, a is less than x is less than b. We also have c is less than y is less than d. Is x less than y? That's what we're trying to find out. Sorry, Jim Jacobson, for crossing off your name there. Okay, so um, these two statements from what we've been given do not intersect at all. They share no variables between the two of them, so their interrelationship, there's nothing we can do to start out with. We need to get to the statements to see whether they give us anything like that. So we get A is less than C. So what that tells us um, is that a is less than c here. So we can get um, a is less than c is less than y is less than d. And we know that a is less than x, but the relationship where x, where the um, x is less than b fits in in this equation down here is not clear at all. So there's, you know, there's a less than, but I'll try and put some ellipses in there. Ah, come on, there we go. So we don't know where this is relative to um, our main expression. So this is not going to be sufficient for us to answer the question where x is relative to y. We can cross off a and d. Let's take a look at statement two. We get b is less than c. So um, that gives us a very clear rela relationship. So we know that b is less than c, which is less than y, which is less than d. And we also know that b is greater than x and greater than a. So here we have a, an absolutely clear progression. Um, not only is x less than y, there are two numbers between x and y, namely b and c. So x is less than y. We have figured it out. So statement two is sufficient. We can circle B and cross off C and E. Two seventy seven, number fifty. How many people are directors of both Company K and Company R? So we need someone who is both K and R. And that's all we know. Statement one. There were 17 directors present at a joint meeting of the directors of company K and company R, and no directors were absent. So what we've been given here is the total number of directors. You re may remember that there is a formula for overlapping sets. Remember, that's the thing that looks like the credit card logo, where you have A and B, and in here we have both, and then if any are, are not in either, then neither is over here. And the formula, the total number of people equals A plus B minus both, because we're, we're double counting, plus neither. And so um, statement number one gives us the total. It says the total equals 17. However, we need uh, A and B in order to figure out the rest of this. We can, I think, safely eliminate the option of um, 
they're being uh, we're not we're not con we're not interested in people in directors who are directors of neither um, company K and company R. So statement one gives us the total, but we still need A and B or K and R in this particular case. It's insufficient on its own. A and D are ruled out. Statement two: Company K has twelve directors and company R has eight directors. So K equals twelve. R equals eight. Did I do that right? Yes. Um, so um, again, that gives us A and B in this equation, and we're trying to figure out what both is, but we would need the total for this one. So statement two also insufficient. So B is not it. Uh, so we're left consulting the two together. So using our formula, we know that 17 equals uh, 12 plus 8 minus those who are directors of both. So 17 equals 20 minus those who are both. Both um, equals 3. So three people are directors. Now again, we don't have to do this math if we don't want to. Um, if you have the luxury of time and, and or uh, have a need to be very sure of your answer, if you can see your way to do the rest of the math and you want to be certain, by all means do it. If you t find yourself more rushed for time or you are quite sure of your answer, um, once you realize that it's solvable, that's enough to say, well, it's solvable. The two statements in conjunction are sufficient. I should circle or select C and move on. So. Your strategy really does vary a little bit when it comes to um, data sufficiency questions, depending on where you are on the test, how you're doing, and your general confidence level with quantitative. So there is not a one-size-fits-all approach to quantitative problems. Um, there is a one-size-fits-all approach to studying, which is to say learn as much as you can, but then when it comes to strategy um, and how you apply strategy, again, that, that varies quite a bit from person to person. So. Sorry for the digression. Let's move on to question number 51. That's a seven. So if x and y are positive, is x over y greater than one? Good question. Nothing we can figure out in advance, so statement number one. Well, actually, I guess we can figure out a little bit in advance. Um, in order for a fraction to be greater than one, basically, um, x needs to be greater than y, right? Because in a fraction where the numerator is smaller than, de than, than the denominator, like one-third or three-fourths or 39 one-hundredths, um, when the numerator is smaller, the fraction is less than one. When these fractions are inverted, three over one, 4 over 3, 100 over 39, the fraction is greater than 1. And when the numbers are equal, it's equal to 1. So this question is also asking us, is x uh, less than y? Or no, no, we want greater than. Well, it's asking what the relationship is between x and y. Is x greater than y? If it is, the fraction is greater than 1. OK. So. Statement number one tells us that x times y is greater than one. Well, you can see from uh, all of these fractions that I have here, um, the numerator times the denominator is greater than one in every single case, but in every single case, it does depend which one is x and which one is y to determine whether x over y is greater than one. I probably shouldn't have done that in that color. No, there we go. So uh, just knowing that x times y is greater than 1, I mean, that's, I'm trying to think if that would be ever be untrue. I suppose if, if, each, if x and y were each fractions, um, it would not necessarily be true that x times y would be greater than 1. Um, and you could still have x over y being greater than 1. But in any case, all this tells us is that x and y are not fractions, or that at least one of them isn't a fraction which isn't a whole lot. So um, that's not enough for us to answer the question. Statement one is not where the juicy goodness of correctness lies. Statement two, we have x minus y is greater than zero. 
we can add y to both sides, that gives us x is greater than y, which is what we were actually originally asking about. If the numerator is greater than the, than the denominator, that's these fractions here, then x over y is greater than 1. So statement 2 is sufficient on its own to give us our answer. Number 52. So a clothing store acquired an item at a cost of X dollars and sold the item for Y dollars. The store's gross profit from the item was what percent of its cost for the item? So we have, um, let's just, we'll say cost equals X, just to use the variables that they use. Uh, sold for y. So their profits equal y minus x. Because that's the amount sold minus the amount it costs to acquire the item. We also know that the, the question is asking um, the store's gross profit from the item was what percent of its cost? So um, in order to figure that, that's actually going to be, um, let's see, profit as percent of cost is going to be that profit as a fraction over the cost. And so this is what we're being asked for in this question. Now we can actually get to the statements. So statement number one y minus x equals 20. So this gives us the numerator of our fraction, uh, the profit as percent of cost. Um, it gives us this part up here, right here. But it doesn't give us the denominator. So uh, this is not going to be sufficient for our purposes. We need both the numerator and the denominator of that fraction in order to figure things out. So it's not a and it's not d. Statement two, y over x equals five over four. So we can do a little fiddling around with this one. Um, if we multiply both sides times x, we get y equals five fourths x. And now we have the whole fraction of the profit as percent of cost as uh, in terms of x. So we could say, for example, y minus x is the same thing as 5 fourths x minus x over x. Um, and 5 fourths x minus, well, minus 1 x is going to equal 1 fourth x over x. We can divide an x out of both the numerator and the, de and the denominator, factor it out. So um, this fraction equals 1 fourth, which is 25%. So statement two on its own was in fact sufficient because it gave us a value for y in terms of x. So we can get rid of c and e and circle b. Next column. Hang on a second there. Okay, so 277, number 53. So we have n minus x plus n minus y plus n minus z plus n minus k. And we're asked what the value is of this expression. Now, there are a number of things that we could do with this expression, and some of them turn out to be useful in the problem later. One thing that you probably would want to do is come up with at least one collapsed form of this, of this expression, because that can come in handy when you hit statements. Without knowing necessarily what you're going to use it for, seeing the same expression in more than one form a lot of times allows you to see your way to the answer more clearly. So really, this is just, you know, um, four n's um, minus x minus y minus z 
minus k, or 4n equals x plus y plus z plus k. One of those two would probably be plenty in terms of a collapsed form for you to look at the same information in a new way. You can, whichever one you would have done is fine. So the value of the expression. So the average, aka the arithmetic mean of x, y, z, and k is n. So the average then would mean um, x plus y plus z plus k, that's a k. The average of those, so it's the sum of the numbers divided by the number of numbers, those divided by 4 equals n. Um, Oh, actually, sorry, this one, this, 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 this thing that I did up here actually is a little bit naughty since we didn't actually have an equation to begin with, so just kind of ignore that I did that. Um, this is the, about the best you can do. Anyway, um, so uh, here we can multiply both sides times n, and we get 4n equals uh, x plus y plus z plus k. And this is starting to look an awful lot like this, and I think I was thinking ahead to this part here, um, so sorry about that. Didn't mean to uh, confuse you. Um, anyway, um, ooh, what does that do? Hmm. Anyway, all of a sudden the cursor changed and I was wondering if it did something interesting. Apparently not. Anyway, so recognizing here that since the average formula gives us the exact same relationship between the things here that you know basically we could say that uh, we can make this look like this by subtracting uh, x plus y plus z plus k, you know, 4n minus x minus y minus z minus k equals 0. That is the value of the expression that we were given in the original question. So we can safely say statement 1 is sufficient for us to answer the question. We can cross off b, and we can cross off c and e also. All three want statement 1 to be insufficient. Statement 2 tells us that x, y, z, and k are consecutive. Which doesn't necessarily tell us anything because we don't have the value for n. Remember, because we need the value of this expression. We, we need the value of n here. And even though n is a constant, and even so then we have 4n minus these consecutive integers, um, we still don't actually have enough to solve for the value because it does depend what those integers are and it depends what n is. We have no n in this one, so no n, so this one must be insufficient. So it's not D, it is A. A taxi company charges F cents for the first mile of a taxi ride and M cents for each additional mile. How much does the company charge for a 10 mile taxi ride? So this question is ultimately asking what is F plus 9M? In order to solve this we need to know what F equals and we need to know what M equals. Or have one solved in terms of the other and have some other thing equal a number. In any case though this is what the question is asking for. It is always good to rephrase what the question is asking for, especially if it asks it in words. Uh, converting it to algebra is the most common form since this is the quantitative section of the test where there's a lot of algebra. Okay, so uh, statement number one tells us uh, the company charges 90 cents for a two mile ride. So what this tells us is that so a two-mile ride is going to be the charge of F for the first mile and the charge of M for the second mile. It's only two miles. That equals 90 cents. Two equations, or two variables and one equation is not enough for us to answer what F plus M equal. There's a lot of different values. F could be 10 cents and M could be 80 cents. F could be 80 cents and M could be 10 cents. We don't know from statement one, so it is insufficient. It's not A and it's not D. Statement number two, the company charges $1.20 for a four-mile ride. So that same, same cost for the first mile, 
plus three, uh, three times m for the three miles beyond the first, that equals uh, $1.20. And for exactly the same reason, um, statement two on its own cannot be sufficient. We don't have enough information to know uh, what f and m are. You know, f could be very large and m very small. f could be very small and m very large. No way of knowing. It's not uh, b on its own either, b which is 2 on its own. So when we consult the two together, we have two equations, two distinct equations, and two variables. And so from there, we could, we could just, if we're confident, we could just say, well, we, yeah, we have enough to solve. Um, on a problem-solving question, what you would need to do is probably uh, subtract them. So you would start with f or substitute, but I like the combination method in part because I actually don't remember learning it um, in high school or anything. Uh, it was only when I started doing test prep uh, or started preparing for tests that I learned about the combination method and I thought, oh man, that's pretty cool. Um, I don't know, so I still think it's pretty neat and I use it when I can. Uh, and the time to use it is when you can pretty easily see how you can eliminate one variable from, the, uh, from your picture by addition or subtraction. By subtracting these two f minus f, 0 is out of the question, 3m minus 1m equals 2m, and um, 120 minus 90 equals 30 cents, therefore m equals 15 cents, and since f plus m equals 90 cents, we know that f equals 75 cents. And from there, it's a simple matter of substituting in um, these two guys into our original equation here, and from there we could solve it. Turns out that it equals $2.10. I went and did the math when I did this before. Um, but uh, you probably shouldn't do that on your actual GMAT because that's way more math. That's time that you could be spending getting more questions right. So don't do that. The two statements together though are sufficient. We cross off E and circle C. We're actually not going to get off of page 277 today, by the way. I probably should just have had that burned onto the image. So we're on number 55. So Guy's net income, or it could be Guy if he's French, but um, so Guy's net income equals his gross income minus his deductions. By what percent did Guy's net income change on January 1st, 1989, when both his gross income and his deductions increased? So what we know about this is that his net income equals his gross income minus his deductions. And that in some way, these two guys are going to be increased, and we are wondering what effect that has on his net income. Until we get to those statements, though, we don't really we don't know that much else. So, uh, guys, gross income increased by four percent on January first, nineteen eighty nine. We find nothing about what happens to his deductions. Um, so, um, the gross uh, goes up four uh, percent. So that's gross times one point oh four. But again, nothing about the deductions, so that's not sufficient. It's not A, and it's not D. Statement number two, his deductions increased by 15%. So deductions went up, so that's um, deductions times 1.15. That's a 15% increase. But it doesn't say anything about his gross income. Definitely not um, sufficient, so it's not B. We can only uh, look at the two together. So his... Um, Previous net income was n equals g minus d. His um, 1, 1, 89 income uh, is going to be n equals that g times 1.04 minus, uh, I didn't leave enough room, sorry about that, d times 1.15. So that's what the two statements together tell us. And what we're being asked is, um, by what percent did the net income change? You will note, though, that we don't actually have any numbers at all 
for g or d. So knowing that we multiply them by 1.04 and 1.15 respectively does nothing for us. So we can't figure out the change in the net income from pre-1989 pre to the beginning of 1989. So even the two statements in conjunction are still insufficient for our purposes. So we can cross off uh, together and circle E for neither one being sufficient on its own nor in conjunction. Fifty-six on page two seventy-seven. What is the value of z in the triangle above? That triangle reproduced here with complete accuracy, as always in my drawings. Um, that was a little bit of a lie, actually. I don't really produce these things very accurately. Anyway, we get the idea. What's the value of z in the triangle above? So an important thing to remember for this one and for the entire quantitative section of the g meta is that the sum of the interior angles of a triangle equal 180. So if we can find out x and y, we can, we can solve for z. Occasionally also, you know, you get problems where you get exterior angles of the triangle, but this isn't one of those problems. Statement 1, x plus y equals 139. So what that tells us is, you know, x plus y plus z equals 180. Um, 139 plus z equals 180. So that's enough to tell us that z equals 41. And again, you could, if you were comfortable enough with your geometry and your math to look at this and say, well, those are the other two numbers that I needed, you could just mark this sufficient and get to the crossing off part uh, right away if you wanted. If you wanted to double check, um, the math is not that hard to follow down that path. Statement two, y plus z equals 108. And again, for the reasons we just described, um, this isn't going to be sufficient. Knowing what y plus z equals can tell us um, what x equals, x equals 72. But without knowing, um, I mean, y could be, um, you know, 1 and z could be uh, 107. Um, you know, it, it, there, or y could be, you know, they could each be uh, 54. Uh, we have no way of telling respectively what y and z are. We just know that, that x is 72 degrees. So this one, not sufficient, leaving answer choice A on its own as our lone sufficient answer. So question number 57. Max has $125 consisting of bills each worth either $5 or $20. How many bills worth $5 does Max have? Forgot to write my thing in over here. So uh, Max has $125. Let's let F equal his $5 bills. And we'll let T equal his $20 bills. Where each of these is the actual number of each of those bills. So what we know then is that uh, 5 times his $5 bills plus uh, 20 times his $20 bills equals 125. There are multiple values for each of these, though, that could um, that could result in this equation being valid. So we need to hit the statements. Um, yeah, you'll, you'll never actually get a data sufficiency question where you get everything you need to answer the question in the original question. 
You will, however, uh, get ones where the predictions you make on the sort of information that you need do appear in the statements. So, you know, let's hope that's one of those. Statement one. Max has fewer than five bills worth $5 each. So, a couple things to know. If he has fewer than five, he has one, two, three, or four, well, or zero. Um, he has zero through four five dollar bills. However, note that 125 is not evenly divisible by 20, okay? Um, which means that there needs to be an odd number of five dollar bills because, you know, if he has no five dollar bills, it's zero. If he has one five dollar bill, that's five, two, ten, three, fifteen, uh, four, twenty. Um, and since the original number that, what's the guy's name, Max? Um, since Max's total dollar value ends in a five, that means that Max has either one five dollar bill or three five dollar bills. Now let's see what this actually ends up being then. Um, if he has one five dollar bill, so let's do fives and twenties equal, you know, 125. So if he has one, uh, let's, let's, do, let's do it this way. If he has five dollars in five dollar bills, that means he needs to have $120 in $20 bills, which would be one five dollar bill and six $20 bills equals 125. So that works fine. What if he has three $5 bills? I should separate these out. So if he has $15 in fives, which is three $5 bills, um, that means he has $115 in $20 bills, which if you're you know doing the math at home, um, ends up not being possible. He can't have five and a half $20 bills. So three $5 bills is not, is not even a possibility here. He can only have one $5 bill if he has fewer than five and it's an odd number and the number of $20 bills ends up being an integer. So statement one is actually sufficient to answer the question because of the way the multiples of five and multiples of 20 worked out. So we can cross off answer choice B as well as C and E. So statement two, uh, Max has more than five bills worth $20 each. More than five. Well, uh, so if he has more than five, he may have six or seven or eight $20 bills. So six times um, $20 bills, the six $20 bills would give him $120, seven $20 bills would give him 140 and we can stop there because we already know he only has $125. So in order to have more than five $20 bills, he can only have six and still be under the dollar amount. And this actually does coincide with what we figured out in statement one, although we have to pretend like we didn't do statement one first. Um, this alone tells us we, he, that he has six $20 bills and one $5 bill equaling his $125. So statement two also is sufficient for us to answer it. So we can cross off A and circle E. Okay, last one on page 277 and also the last one for the session. So if the ratio of the number of teachers to the number of students is the same in school district M and school district P, what is the ratio of the number of students in school district M to the number of students in school district P? So what this tells us is that the teachers in M to the students in M is the same ratio as the teachers in P over the students in P. And what the question is asking us is what the ratio of these two things are, which is really actually asking then what the relative ratio is of the two school districts. Does that make sense? So um, 
because these two things are proportional, they're the same ratio, but not necessarily the same number. So, you know, just as an example, if um, school district M has four students and one teacher total, and um, school district P has 100 uh, teachers and 400 students, they have the same ratio. They're both one to four, but the number of students is actually different. And what this one is actually asking us then is if this re these are the real numbers, what are the relative ratios of the, um, the two school districts? How do they compare to each other? And, you know, so either a ratio of S uh, of the students in M to the students in P, or likewise, um, figuring out something with um, the teachers in each, this would be sufficient. Let's see what we get. Statement number one, uh, there are 10,000 more students in school district M than there are in school district P. So school district M is in fact the bigger one. That equals school district P plus 10,000. Which is good to know, but it doesn't actually give us a basis. So for, to get the ratio that we're after here, we actually need the real numbers for the students in M and the students in P. We know that um, you know that this is going to then equal. Um, so we can rewrite what we have: SP plus ten thousand over SP, but without knowing what this number is, it's still a big question mark. So statement one is not sufficient. Cross off A. Cross off D. Statement two. The ratio of the number of teachers to the number of students in school district M is 1 to 20. So TM to SM equals 1 20th. And from the original question, we also know that that is going to also equal the teacher and student ratio in school district P. Um, but without knowing the actual relative numbers, you know, as I kind of tried to show here, they can have the same ratio without having the same actual number. Um, and so even though we have established the ratio, we haven't established the actual numbers. So statement two, also insufficient because we need actual numbers. I keep em emphasizing that, but we need the real numbers here to figure out this ratio. Um, or we need more real numbers that allow us to get there algebraically. So statement two is insufficient. We cross off B. All that is left is consulting them in conjunction. And even so, the only place we were actually given a real number is in um, statement one, where we find out that, the, that there are 10,000 more students in school district M. We aren't actually given the number of students in either place. What if school district M has one student, or, or excuse me, 10,001, and school district P has 10,000? Uh, no, excuse me, one. Wow, let me say that sentence again. Let's say that, um, I'll put the real numbers down. That means SP equals um, one. It could just as easily be um, 100 uh, students, and so then SP equals 100. Each of these would give us a different ratio in the original question, and it's still true that um, School District M has 10,000 more students. So without knowing the real numbers, even the statements in conjunction, both together, we are still um, insufficient, and therefore we can cross off the together option. Answer choice E is the correct one. So that's probably close enough to the end of the session um, to stop there. And also, you know, getting up through question number 58 is what was advertised online. So we will stop there. Next time, we will just continue where we left off with um, question number 59 on page 278, and we'll do another 14 questions there. Thanks for joining me today. My name is Jim Jacobson. That's me here. You've been listening to me go through the official guide to the test, the 12th edition of that official guide on Grokkett's OGTV. Keep listening and watching, and we will keep going through the official guide, giving you the answers and explanations to every single problem in the book. That's it. I'll see you next time.